Hello and welcome to the ALF Movement Podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and on today's show we have Mr. Keith Petit. Now Keith is, um, or he was a very high level gymnast, like exceptionally high level gymnast. Um, he is now coaching both um, children and more recently he has started coaching um, CrossFit athletes as he's seen like holes in their game with efficiency and movement. The reason why you should listen to this is not only because Keith was, it's like, this is one of my favorite favorite episodes that I've recorded we really get into the weeds but we're also going to go into like how to build your handstand from scratch how to get a muscle up the most common mistakes people make and um, gymnastics for me is something that people massively 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 underappreciate um, and the other thing that Keith has been incredibly kind to do is there's two of his um, ebooks that are up for grabs um, for completely free usually these are about 15 20 dollars um, but we've got most of them for free for you guys so so if you head over to alphamovement.co slash Keith, so alphamovement.co slash K-E-I-T-H, you will find um, Keith's ebooks completely free for you guys. Um, hopefully you see that and enjoy the show. So Keith, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Okay, good. Nice. Um, so let's start off with, tell me the story of, of how you got to this point being a gymnastics coach. Um, when I was little, my parents, you know, I bounced around a lot. So they put me in gymnastics and I, you know, since I was like 10 years old, I was in the gym 20 hours a week. Um, I competed, you know, competed college. Uh, then when I graduated from college, I just started helping out at night at a gym. And the next thing you know, you know, I'm coaching 20 hours a week. Um, I've had a few, you know, a few national champions, about 20 national team members. So, um, you know, it, it's just been kind of a, a fun thing. Gymnastics has always been a part of my life, so I enjoy coaching it. And then it kind of warped into my nephew started taking CrossFit. So um, I started helping him and his friends with handstands and muscle-ups and things like that. And then the next thing you know, I'm doing box visits, clinics, and I'm coaching, you know, a lot of these top-level CrossFitters just trying to use my gymnastics to teach them, you know, kind of to be more efficient in their movements with proper technique. So we'll come back to all that. Um, we'll come back to the, um, the, the kind of CrossFit side of things and, and the coaching side of things. But where, whereabouts did you grow up? I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. What's, what's it like there? Because I, I, I've no idea. Oh, it's just, you know, it's just the regular suburbs. Yeah. It's a, you know, Cincinnati is a pretty big town, not huge, but, um, you know, we have Major League Baseball. And, you know, I lived about 20 minutes from the city out in the suburbs. So, you know, we had the white picket fence and <laughs> everything like you see in movies, pretty much. <laughs> is there a big kind of gymnastics gene or anything like that in your, in your family? Do, does anyone else do gymnastics that you, uh, um, that you were kind of around a lot? No, you know, my, my dad played football. You know, my, our family was pretty athletic. My sister started gymnastics when I did. She was older than me, and she kind of just would boss me around, so I did whatever she wanted to do, and that's kind of how it happened. Nice. Um, so talk to me about the first few years of you starting gymnastics training. Um, what, what does that look like in terms of your training? Well, back then it was a little bit different than it is now because, you know, now we pick six-year-olds or whatever, and we – it's pretty organized. Then we kind of just went to the YMCA and we bounced on tramp and we tumbled. Um, it wasn't until I was probably like 11 or 12 when I was going in the gym 20 hours a week, um, you know, going on in, you know, I, I would leave school, go into the gym. We'd spend a half hour work, you know, warming up. And then, you know, three and a half hours later, practice would be over. So three and a half hours seems like a long time to train. Yeah, but I, I think people don't realize we they sit around. You know, we it's not it's not like we're going three and a half hours running. You know, mm. you'll take a turn and you'll rest. You know, you'll take a turn and you'll rest. You, you know, I mean, there's a lot of downtime during that three and a half hours. When you're when you're training, what's what's going through your mind? Because like something that kind of comes to my head is that it's so technical. Um, are you like before you, you visualizing what's going on, are you running through what's going to, what it's going to look like. I assume that's what's like during competition, but, um, is there anything you'll focus on when you're training? You know, we do so many, like when we go to an event, all of the, you know, we'll warm up 
every day the same exact way doing our basics, you know, so everything is broken down, you know, I mean, even when you're a top elite, you'll get up on high bar and you'll start every single person, bar none, will start with swing, swing half turns, you know, so it's like, your shapes and everything are so automatic because you've done them all the time that a lot of times, you know, you, you're able to just focus on one or two corrections that you want to make because everything else becomes just natural because you've done everything. You've done the drills a billion times. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. What kind of shapes are you talking about? Um, you know, just like the, the typical, you know, the hollow, the open arch, the hollow shape. You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of the basis in all of gymnastics, you know, I mean, every swing on high bar is the same as every swing on rings as every swing on, on parallel bars, you know, we're, we're going through that, you know, chest in hollow body, open the chest through the bottom, tight arch, kicking to a nice hollow body again, and, you know, and, and that swing is the basis for everything we do. We just kind of change the timing or we hollow a little more, or arch a little more in order to do a bigger skill. What's the, like the, the marks of a good hollow and a good arch. And, and can you go into a bit of detail about what exactly that looks like for people who are kind of yeah. unaware of that as well? Um, a good hollow would be um, if you lay on your back, your back is lower back is flat on the back and you're rounded in your chest and your arms are by your ears, you know, so your, your shoulders are, you know, your shoulders aren't, aren't, your arms aren't pulled down. They're just right by your ears and your toes are up on the ground, you know? Um, and, and in gymnastics, um, we like to have a lot of the swing done through the chest and the shoulders versus just in the hips. You know, the, you know, you'll see some people swinging and they're swinging all in their hips and not in their chest. And we like to think it's like a whip. A longer whip is a more powerful whip. So if you can get more of your body doing the motion, then you're going to do that. Your swing is going to be more efficient and it's going to be more powerful. So good hollow is really rounded in the upper back and in the chest um, where your shoulders are up off the ground. Um, a, a good arch is, you know, same thing. Your arms, your armpits are open. They're by your ears. Um, and you just have your heels and your, your chest is off the ground. Cause that's, that's very different to what you hear in kind of the majority of movements um, in terms of like squatting, pulling, um, like deadlifting kind of, you're still complete neutral spine, no movement from right. that spine. Um, so why are we looking to kind of, get to get to those arches and those shapes because that's kind of you know if you if you think of when you're little and you're swinging on a swing and you're kicking your legs back and forth you you, you know what i mean so that's what that's that those are the shapes we're we're basically doing with our body in order to build up power so if we're swinging around on the high bar when we're dropping from the handstand we want to have a nice tight hollow shape and then, because then that's going to allow us to open up our, you know, to then throw, push back on the bar and open up in our chest. So then we can kick again, so we can have more power. You know, that, that's just, it, it's, it, you know, those are strong shapes and they create power when we swing is why we like okay, to Okay, nice. Um, so you, so you started training, um, you got to kind of, a, do you say 11 to 13 when you started doing about like three hours a day, something like that? Right, right. Okay. And then what, what happened with your training after that? Um, then I went to college. I went to Michigan State University, and um, I competed for Michigan State for four years. And, you know, went to USA Championships and things like that. Um, and then I graduated from college. And so then, you know, back then it was when you were done with college, your gymnastics career was pretty much over. So then I took an engineering job and was done with gymnastics. How, how did that feel? Um. You know, it was kind of, you, you knew when it was going to be over, so you were prepared for it, but it was kind of sad. Mm-hmm. You know, you, uh, it wasn't sad, but it was just weird because all of a sudden you used to work out, you know, 20 hours a week, and then you didn't, you, yeah. you know, and, you, and you're kind of like, well, now what do I do with my time and my life, you know? And so I think when I got my, my job down here, my engineering job, then I was like, okay, well, I'll coach because I'm used to doing that. And so that's, that's how the coaching started. Right. What was your training like when you were at university? Uh, you, you know, we would, we would do the same thing. We would go in about three and a half hours. Uh, you know, there would be people that 
did all around in there, you know, so it's a little bit different. Like I was an all arounder, so I did all six events. So what I had to do would be different than somebody who was just a ring specialist or a ball specialist. So um, typically we would, we would go in, we would stretch, we do basic tumbling. Mm. Um, and then we would do three or four events a day for 45 minutes. Um, you know, and then we do 40 minutes of strength every day after that is kind of how, how our workouts would be. So I'm, I'm assuming you saw a lot of people who, who kind of made it in inverted commas and people who, who didn't quite make it and people who kind of fell by the wayside. What's the thing that separates the people who, who make it from the people that don't make it? Um, one is talent. I mean, you have to have talent. There's, you know, I mean, you have to have kind of a God-given ability to do gymnastics. Um, and then a lot of it is just, you know, you, you just got to like it and you got to just keep working. A lot of people, you know, don't, you know, they don't like that every single day doing something. It's, it's not, you know, you watch the Olympics and you see everyone throw in these big fun tricks and the big fun tricks are fun, but you don't realize how long and how many drills and how monotonous it is every single day going in there and doing it. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of people just get bored and just don't want to work hard enough. And then probably the third part, and it's equally as important, is, is you've got to have a coach that's going to be right there with you and teaching you. Um, because, you know, if you don't have someone that knows what they're doing, you're not going to be any good, no matter how hard you work and no matter how talented you are. Yeah. So you started training. Um, oh, sorry. So you, you finished university, got your engineering job. Um, and what was what happened with your training at that point? Did it just completely fall by the wayside? Did you stop training completely, or do you still have a, have some training stuff in there? Yeah, you know, I just did nothing. And, you know, I got a little bit not in great shape. Mm. You know, I would once in a while lift weights, but not really, because it was just weird. You just didn't know what to do. You know, lifting didn't wasn't as fun. I didn't really know what the heck I was doing, so I would just go in there and just, you know, wander the gym. Um, you know, I would still play, you know, I could get up and swing on high bar and, and do dips and things like that. But it was, it definitely was weird going from being in like perfect shape, being in the gym 20 hours a week to all of a sudden nothing. And that's kind of what I did. And that's a lot of my friends do that too. Mm. I, can, I can imagine that's very hard actually. Um, how, how'd that feel that, that transition? You, you know, at first, cause I, I had another term, to, I had another semester at college. So. I think at first I didn't really, you know, I would then be able to have more fun and have free time and, you know, go out, which I, I never really had. So at first it, it wasn't that big a deal, you know, but then, then you just kind of feel like you're missing something. And, you, you know, I always would, I'd be sitting around watching TV and I'd be like, you know, why am I watching TV? I never used to have time to watch TV, you know? So it, it was, you know, it was hard. Mm. Can you describe the moment that you started coaching again or that you decided that it'd be a good idea to start coaching? Well, I had it. I, I would coach up it in, when I was in college, a little bit of summer camp. And there was a kid that needed, um, that was moving to Cincinnati because, you know, he didn't have very good coaching up there. And so I kind of coach, started coaching because of him. And it was just going to be like, okay, I'm going to coach this kid for two years. He's going to graduate and then I'm going to move on. Well, then you get attached to a new group of kids and you're like, okay, I'm going to, when this one's done, you know, so it, 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 the cycle just keeps repeating. So, you know, and, and, and I, I love coaching cause I love gymnastics. I like, um, you know, it, it's a really interesting sport and it's funny how it's changed even from when I did gymnastics, how techniques change and kids are doing stuff that I'd never thought people would ever do. And it's, it, it's just fun. Can you give me some examples of that? Um, like a vault. You know, a vault on, on, you know, a handspring, you know, like if you watch the Olympics, you know, you run down the vault and you hit on your hands and you do a front flip. And, you know, when I was competing, if you did a handspring front with a full and a half twist, say, that was huge. Well, now they're doing two and a half twists, you know, and now they're doing, you know, after I graduated, people were doing handsprings and then they would do two two and a half flips and land on their feet. Like that's a huge ball. Well, this last Olympics, a guy did three and a half flips. Off his head. I mean, it wasn't pretty and it was kind of scary, but I would have never fathomed someone would do that ball, you know, and, and it's a little bit, the training's better, the technique's better, 
the equipment's a little bit, you know, the boards are better now than they were, you know, so it's a, you know, the table, the ball table's different. So it's all everything coming together, but it, it's amazing what people are doing. What strikes me as interesting is with gymnastics, there's been, or from what I can see, there's, there's very little changing in the technology used. If you compare it to some other sports, um, like any kind of, any, any kind of sports where you're moving your body, it seems like gymnastics is using like almost the like very similar um, equipment to, to, to like previously or to have many years ago, but it's just people developing at such an extreme rate. Right. I yeah. think everyone's, you know, some equipment's changed very, very slightly. You know, the, the, the springs are a little bigger on floor now than they used to be, but it doesn't matter that much. Um, the high bars is the same. The rings are the same. You know, the parallel bars are a little bit skinnier than they used to be, so you can hold on better. But, yeah, the equipment has changed. It's just everyone's gotten smarter with, you know, their, their technique. And, you know, somebody figures out a new te- technique, and boom, everybody does it. You know, I mean, high bar disc mounts used to be, you know, people kind of just used to fling off the bar. Well, now, you know, the Chinese or the Jap- Chinese figured out a new, new, a new beat about 15 years ago. Now everybody uses that beat, and high bar disc mounts are a lot better. Yeah, it looks fantastic. It looks incredible. When you're when you, when you're kind of looking for those advancements, how how does that go about? Because have you got like I, I don't know, I don't even know whether you know this. But, um, I thought I'd ask you anyway. Like, if you've got like if you've got like an idea of a trick or um, a trick, a movement in your head that you're trying to perform, or do you kind of or does it kind of not happen by luck, or is it kind of inspiration or that kind of stuff? I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think, you know, you have a, a gymnast that might have a strength that other people don't have. And you're looking, like, I had a kid, and he was really good, but he was four foot 11, full grown, you know, and he mm-hmm. you know, made world trials and things. Um, and so he swang P bars like nobody ever swang P you know and so twice and they catch in their upper arms and it was you know one of those things where it was you know hey you can do that stretch you can do that, that leg out and it, and we did it because you kind of just realized you're a special gymnast you know you can do this where no one else can do it and I think you know that's where people are you know they might just say hey I'm doing this skill I bet I can add another full twist and they just work the drills and there it is. They run it or they don't. So when we're, oh, yeah, I'm not saying. Um, so when we're looking to, um, to start a, a gymnast or, or start just, let's, let's start with a child. Actually, if you're, if you're starting with a, with a, a child, you've almost got like a blank canvas. Um, what's like, where would you start with, with movements, with, with technique, with strength? Like, yeah. The, at the very beginning, you know, we, our kids go into, um, preschool gymnastics class and and basically all that is is we're teaching them how to jump how to you know pull the do a chin up you know it's kind of like a big giant obstacle course for the kids so they're kind of learning gymnastic movements like forward rolls and swinging um but they don't know they're learning it because yeah. you know they're six and five years old you know they're just learning how to you know hurdle off foot and they don't know they're learning to hurdle off a foot they're just mm-hmm. jumping on one foot um, and so then what happens is then there will be kids that are a little bit more talented than the others. And those kids, then we pull into special groups and then we start specializing, you know, actually doing chin ups with them and, um, teaching them cartwheels and teaching them how to run with proper technique and, um, you know, and, and, and doing lots of handstands. And, um, from there, then we move them on to, you know, maybe another special group or we move them on to a pre-team where they'll actually get up on the equipment and we'll start teaching them, you know, real skills and, and having an hour, hour and a half practice, trying to teach them real gymnastics type movements and, you know, working, making sure that everything that you do from the beginning, you don't mess a kid up so that they have problems when they're later on because everything you teach when they're, you know, seven and eight and six affects their gymnastics the whole rest of their their career you know if you teach if a kid learns how to twist the wrong way the wrong direction that has repercussions repercussions on his the rest of his career and it you know it might make his ball bad or you know because he's twisting the wrong way and that's all tied at seven years old you know 
What, what do you mean by twisting the wrong way? Um, so like we either call you a lefty or a righty when you twist. Mm. So that would be like if you jump up in the air and you turn, you know, leading with your left shoulder, that's twisting to the left. If you jump up in the air and you to the right, that's a right twist. And there's moves where, you know, you want to make sure that if you're going to flip backwards, you're going to twist the same way as if you're going to flip forwards, you know, so because everything kind of comes together. And there's a, there's a fall that we do that if you are, if you put your right hand down first and you, and you don't twist right off the horse, then it's going to be a whole lot harder than, than the other direction because you're going to basically have to twist more to do the same ball. I know we're kind of getting a little too technical, but cool. it, it's just an example of one of those things where if you screw a kid up at the very beginning by teaching him to twist the wrong way, then his, his career, not that his career is ruined, but his vault is going to be, you're, you're taking one sixth of an event. So what are the, the kind of other ways that people can like, in terms of like screw up kids is um, kids kind of uh, gymnastics careers. Cause it, it seems like one of those times where you have to go slow to go fast. Right. You know, I think it's a lot of times when you have younger gymnasts, um, it, it, it's all about the basics and, you know, they might rush through skills because a kid can do it, but they're not learning them the right way. So then when they get older, then I'm going to have to reteach them. You know, it might be something so simple as, you know, a back handspring, which is, you know, you do a round off, which is like the cartwheel thing, and then you do a back handspring out of it. And, and they might not have their hands. We want our hands slightly turned in, um, not turned out. And, it, and it's a, it might seem something that nobody cares about and why does it matter which way your hands are, are, are are facing, but it's super important because one, it's easier on the wrist. So the kids aren't going to have a, a bad wrist problem when they, you know, on the back hands from their back hand springs. And two, it's just a, a more powerful push. So, you know, if they want to tumble bigger, they should have their hands turned in and, and three, it just looks better. So, I mean, you know, it, it's something that you might not think about, but if, if you allow your kid to do that, they're going to do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of back hand springs with their hands turned out that then when they get older, they're never going to be able to fix it. And that's just like going to be something wrong in their gymnastics or, you know, you, they're growing up and you let them, you know, have a bad shape in a handstand, you know, and, and, you know, their shoulder angles bad and they're archy in their back. And, and that becomes their new norm is that shape. And, you know, that shape isn't aesthetically pleasing shape. It's, it's not as stable a shape, but, you know, so, and, and then that shape will then transfer over to the other events when you pass through a handstand. So it's, it's one of those things where if you allow a kid to keep having bad habits on his basics when he's little, then it's going to make it a lot harder when he's older to actually fix those. So you kind of want to teach them when they're right mm. from the beginning so that then when they're older, you know, because I coach most of the older kids that I'm not then having to go back and and, and spend hours on fixing their hands on their back hands or their handstand shape. Yeah. I, I, the thing that comes to mind is practice doesn't make perfect practice makes permanent. Um, so if you, if you keep on practicing those poor positions, those poor, poor shapes, it's what you're going to replicate for the rest of your life. And I assume that's something that you, that you see with adults as well. Um, when it comes to, Oh yeah, I want to get a muscle up straight away. I want to get um, an iron cross maybe, but they just don't have the, the prerequisite strength, skill and flexibility. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you have to do the basic work first before you throw those big tricks. You know, other you might be able to get a big trick, but it's not. You're never going to then do that next trick. You know, and and we're always looking for that next trick. So we never want to we never want to put a kid ceiling where it shouldn't be. We want it to be as high as possible. Okay. What are those basics movements? Like, um, you've mentioned a few like chin ups and hollow positions and handstands. Um, if someone was starting now, where would they start in terms of the basic skills and drills? Um, I, I would put them, you know, the first thing that I thing that I do with everybody, my kids, the, you know, the CrossFit people that I work with is belly to wall handstands, I think are super important. Um, because it teaches you, you know, getting your hands as close as you can to the wall. So we're going to open up our armpits, 
you know, so that we don't have shoulder angle and it, it's getting them comfortable being upside down. Um, I would also work regular old chin-ups, strict chin-ups. I would work, you know, work towards getting dips. I think a dip is an incredibly, you know, important, you know, skill. A lot of gymnastics is done pushing. So we do lots of dips because that's an important strength feature we need. I would do hollow holds and I would probably do arch holds, you know, and toast and leg lifts. Those are probably the, the things I would start with. In terms of programming for those movements, um, are you always doing body weight or do you ever add external weight to it? We, our kids will add, you know, if they're going to be doing, you know, dips, they'll add weight vests to it. Um, and same with chin-ups, so they will add it. Or they'll vary, you know, the time. So they might do slow dips or slow handstand push-ups or, you know, or the, the angle. Does that make sense? So they'll vary, they'll vary kind of their position to make it easier or harder also, besides putting weight on. Okay. And, and then when you program for, um, for like holds, so whether it's, a, as you said, a belly to wall handstand hold, how would you program for that? Would you, would you find out a max time that they could hold it for, or would you just build up gradually? Um, because if we look at kind of, like I'm, I'm a complete kind of um, beginner to, to programming for gymnastics. But if you look at strength training, it, lots of it is done off a percentage of one rep maximum. So the most weight you can lift for one reps. Um, is that a kind of a similar way you program if you had a percentage of a handstand hold or would you just build up over time? We would just build up over time, but I w- we would make sure that if it wasn't good, then you got to come down. It's got to be perfect. Okay. You know, don't, don't, but we, it's not like I put them up there for five minutes or 10 minutes. It's usually we do a couple for a minute. Um, just because, you know, we're basically just trying to reinforce a shape, you know, a perfect shape and get a little stronger in that, in that position. Um, if you stay up in the handstand for too long on the floor, you know, it, it starts getting on the wrists, you know, hurting their wrists a little bit. So, you know, probably a minute to two minute max is, is, any, is where we would go. Okay, so that um, inevitably brings up the question: What makes a good handstand? A good handstand is it, it, it is perfectly straight. Is what what our goal is. So, um, what we would want is our arms to be perfectly over our over our head, with our shoulders right on our ears. And I think that's the issue that a lot of people have is they don't have the whole mobility in their shoulders in order to do a good handstand. So what they end up doing is because they can't open their, their, their shoulder angle all the way up to 180 degrees, they, ha- they have a little bit of shoulder angle. So then they're going to have that, that arch in their body, you know, so it, you know, where we want it to be, you want to open up your shoulder angle all the way. You want your ribs in. So you want to rotate your chest a little bit in, and then you want to have a perfectly flat back. So um, the easiest way to work that is to either just lay on the ground and try to push out as tall as you can, trying to push your armpits to the, to the ground and squeeze your butt and try to make yourself just a nice long shape. And then the other good place to put it is to do belly to the wall handstands and put your hands as close to the wall as you can and push up as tall as you can and making sure that, you know, your shoulders are right over your ears, your armpits are open and you have no lower back arches what we like okay um what are the things that like because basically i i see a lot of um people like doing all kinds of crazy things with their ankles and feet um are are you talking toes pointed or feet relaxed we we do toes pointed okay and why is that um well because it's a deduction if you don't have (laughs) it pointed and it it looks better yeah and you know you you want your whole body to be tight you know you don't want you know if, if when if you're like super tight and your shoulders and everything squeeze and then you have flappy feet, you're it's gonna go down the rest of your body. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah, um I I'm reading um something by Carl Pauli. I think it was in his book, uh Freestyle, which is very good, but he talks about the length creating tension throughout your body. So the longer you can get it, the more things are stretched and the more tension you can create, and that's quite a nice way to look at things. When we yeah, it's kinda like when we swing it looks like we're loose, but we mm-hmm. always have tension in our body. It's always about, you know, long, making yourself as long as you can, because then you're, you know, you have more power. It's, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I think something that people massively underestimate is is what you just mentioned. That if people are coming, for example, off the bars and they think that people are just relaxed there and letting their bodies, um, letting their body kind of spin, but you you see the tension that's going on there and you see the contractions that's happening and there's there's a lot of force going through them at that point. Right, right. I mean, they're not falling into those shapes. You're putting your body into those shapes. Does mm. that make sense? You're pushing against the bar to open up your chest so that then you can then kick as hard as you can to go over the bar. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. How else would we look at building up um, mobility, specifically shoulder and thoracic mobility for a handstand? You know, I, if you would go into a, a gym with a, a male elite athlete, the first thing that he will do, every single one of them will be pull out an exercise band. And, you know, I think this is kind of something that people don't do enough and we all, you know, and, and we do our, all of our rotator cuff exercises first, if that makes sense. Um, Cause it's always one of those things where we're putting our, our body in such horrible shapes. I mean, that maybe we're not supposed to be doing, I don't know, maybe we are, but um, that you have to make sure that you're strong in your rotator cuff. So we always start with that to kind of get our shoulders warm. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, doing a lot of the cat stretches, you know, where you might put your hand up on the bars and open up your shoulders, trying to push your chest down. Um, yeah. We also do um, a good, a good, a good stretch is, you know, you do a handstand with your feet a little bit away from the bar, from the wall, and then try to push against the wall while you duck your head and open up your, sh- your shoulders as far as you can. So you're kind of getting an arch in that upper back and in your in your in your shoulders much like a bridge yeah but it's it's more gentle on your lower back than a bridge is you know if you're older and everything bridges i don't you know i you know i i don't like a lot of lower back arching so this is makes it a little bit easier if you can picture you put your feet against the wall yeah you 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 push you push your shoulders over your hands um and then we, we we partner stretch a lot where i would lay on the ground Um, you know, with my arms in front of me, my face on the ground, and someone would just sit on my upper back, grab my elbows and pull up and Mm -hmm. and just gently pull up and talk and, you know, make sure that they're not going to over pull. um, But it's just a way to gently kind of stretch your shoulders. Is that done before training or after training? Um, We do it a little bit of both. I mean, when we we stretch, we we do like a pre-strength just to kind of get our body going. Mm -hmm. And then we do a little bit of stretching like that. And then after workout, then we'll do more shoulder stretching and splits and pike stretch too. Okay. And then in terms of strength for, um, for handstands, how would you go about building that? Um, one is just doing them against the wall. But, um, you know, a good way to start would be to, you know, you get like a box and you, you just put your hands on the ground and the, your feet up on the box and kind of just work on holding yourself up that way, trying to get your butt over your head, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're pike and, you know, and, and just getting stronger that way. Um, then it's, you move to the wall. You know, I think the easiest way is to, you know, put your hands so that your, your stomach would be facing the wall and climb up as high as you can. And if you only get to 45 degrees with your feet up, that's great. You know, Mm. as you get more comfortable, you can then, walk closer to the wall. Um, we do, we have the kids do a lot of, you know, we'll have a, you know, where they just hold a, a small weight, you know, a small five, 10 pound dumbbell and they'll just hold them over their head, opening up their shoulder and trying to just hold it there, you know, and they hold it there for 30 seconds. And that's, that's kind of reinforcing pushing down against something and opening up your armpits too, and getting stronger at that position. Okay. When we're um, overhead, because I, you said open up your armpits um, and previously you said when you're doing a backspring, you're internally rotating your shoulders. So for everyone listening, like if you had your hands pushed out in front of you, internally rotating would be like rotating your thumbs towards each other. And then right. for, um, for external rotation, it would be spinning your th- thumbs away from each other. Um, so like your right hand would go clockwise. When like, what's the, the prerequisites or when are you, when you internally rotating your shoulders and when are you externally rotating your shoulders in gymnastics? You you know, I think it, um, it just depends on the skill. 
Mm. We, um, you know, you want your hands turned in, internally rotated on a back handspring just because that, that's better when you, your hands hit the ground. It's better on your wrists. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the handstand, we usually like to basically have your hands pointed neutral so they're not turned out or they're turned in. Okay. Um, just because it's, it's sort of like, you know, walking. You, you know, if you're going to walk, you're more stable with your feet pointed forward than pointing out or pointing in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you can create torque from that position, whereas if you... Right. Feet- and then when you're up, then you can kind of rotate your elbows out to create a more, you know, so you're pushing down a little bit harder. Okay, yeah. Um, that's, that's a big mistake I see people making. Like, obviously, I've got extremely limited gymnastic experience as opposed to you. Um, but like, I see people who aren't pressing into the floor at all and they're just letting their shoulders come just like the, as Kelly says, um, just hanging off their meat. Um, and like, what's the, what's the issue with, with that? I, I think it's, that's, it, it's exactly what we said earlier when you asked about the toes, you know, mm. the handstand goes all the way from the toes all the way to the fingers. So when you're doing a handstand, you know, you're, you should be balancing with your fingers. So you should be shoving your hand into, you know, your, your, into the floor. So, um, you know, it's all about, and, and then it's, it's about pushing through, you know, you don't want to be saggy in your back or saggy in your shoulders, or you're not going to be able to hold it long and it's not going to be a very stable handstand. So, you know, we tell the kids push up as tall as you can, you know, when they're doing handstands against the wall, I'll put my hand above their toes and say, okay, push up and touch my hand. And they can always go up another two to three inches. Well, maybe not two or three, you know, an inch or so. So, It's, it's all about pushing all the way through and realizing that the handstand goes from the toes all the way to the fingers. And, and you know, you, you have to keep all of that tight. And nice. That's a really interesting point. Really interesting point. Like it's, it's something that uh, if you if you watch a CrossFit wad, that's the, the opposite of what you see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's funny because they'll, you know, even just kicking up, you know, they'll just kind of flail their body and not realize that, you know, the second your hands touch the ground, you should be pushing down on them and you should be mm. trying to control yourself with your fingers. You know, that, that way you should, you know, you should always be able to kick up the handstand and hold because you have control from the second your hands hit the floor. Okay. So in terms of kicking up to a handstand, say you've, um, you've spent a lot of time against the wall, you're starting to find your balance points, you're understanding pressing through your fingers and your heels. What's the progression to getting away from the wall? Um, you know, I, I always have people, you know, have someone, a buddy stand next to you if you're afraid. Um, yeah. But it, once you start to go to handstand, but I would say the first thing you do is you just kind of work on um, picking a leg. Always, always kick up with the same leg. I'm, I'm always, it's always funny when I work with them because I, you know, you see people switching back and I think, what, what are you doing? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you, you know, something very basic, but always kick off the same leg. Um, so that it's always the same. Mm. And then I would, uh, you know, make sure that you bend your front leg when you, when you kick up and make sure when your, your feet, your hands touch the ground, you're automatically pushing down. And I would just work on kicking just a little bit and then, ki- and then coming down, not even going to vertical, just going just a little bit higher and a little bit higher, feeling the push against the ground, feeling your fingers trying to balance. And then as it gets more comfortable, then I would just go ahead and, and kick up to handstand. You know, I mean, a good place to start would be if you don't have a spotter would be then just like against the wall with your back to the wall, a couple feet, you know, a foot or so away. So if you kick up and you go over, you just fall into the wall. Okay. And then you can kind of kick off the wall and try to hold it. Yeah. And then fall back into the wall. So you kind of just work with the wall and only use the wall when you really need it. If, if, or, you can have a buddy next to you, you know, kind of helping you so that you don't fall over. Because a lot of it is just practicing. Everyone can get a, if you have decent flexibility in your shoulders and wrists, you just got to practice. You know, I mean, people, people snatch and all that, you know, every single day. And then they do handstands or, you know, once every two weeks. And they say, I don't understand why I can't do it. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And then in terms of like the other, actually, um, do you work with guys on handstand walking and what is like, I'm, I'm assuming you see a lot of dodgy shit going on with people handstand walking because I, I certainly do. Um, what are the kind of common mistakes you see with, with handstand walking? 
you know, a lot of it is because of the shoulder flexibility. So that's something that you're going to have to fix if you want to have a good handstand walking. So um, the guys especially, they um, because their shoulders are so tight, their hands will be really wide, yeah. you know, wider than shoulder width apart. And you'll hear that they're really heavy on their hands. And it's because, you you know, you have to shift over your hands, you know, to in order to pick one up. So the wider they are, the more you have to shift. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, know? Yeah. you know, I mean, if you tried to walk with your feet really wide, you'd walk really funny <laughs> and it wouldn't be comfortable. So, you know, the goal is to get your hands shoulder width apart or close. Um, mm-hmm. You know, then the other issue that we always have is, is people get saggy in the back. You yeah. Know? And, and that's always caused by, you know, having shoulder angle. You know, in order to balance, if you have shoulder angle, then you're going to have to arch your back in order to get your feet over your head. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, some people can walk like that and it's fine, but the longer they go, then the harder their back's going to crank up, cramp, mm. uh, cramp up and it's going to be harder. You know, it's, it's like holding a weight over your head. Are you stronger holding your weight directly over your head or holding it at 45 degrees? It's, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to just push, push down on the floor in a perfectly straight line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and then to go forward. You, you, you got to do a couple different things. You either got to let your whole body lean over, you got to bend your legs, or you got to arch a little. And, you know, and I think that is kind of preference. I mean, if my kids, we make them keep perfectly straight body when they hands stay long because that's just a basic, we're working on shapes and leaning and things. But if you're, if, if you're going for time and you're going for distance, you're going to bend your legs or you're going to arch a little bit. And, mm. and that's okay. You know, as long as you think of, pushing through your shoulders and having your shoulders open, you'll be a lot better because as your shoulders start to close, then you're going to have to arch even more and it just becomes, you know, and then even to walk, you're going to have to arch even more to get your feet over your head. So it just becomes a lot more difficult. Okay, nice. And then let's talk muscle ups. What's uh, like, obviously it's such a, such a like kind of a, a shiny object syndrome people just like oh that looks cool i'm gonna do that um especially with like, the kind of the rise of crossfit as we've kind of spoken about um people see a muscle up and like, oh, i've got to do that that's that's a cool thing to be doing what are the most common mistakes that you see with with muscle up you know i think it's the person isn't strong enough to do it in the first place i get that a lot you know mm-hmm. um, i work with some ladies and they come and i say well let me see your ring dip they can't do a ring dip and I say well it's, you know unless you have the most amazing swing in the world you're not going to be able to do a muscle up um, so the first thing is you know you have to do strict chin ups and you have to be able to do strict dips you know? do you have a number that you should be able to hit before you you know I don't really I, I you know I tell them probably seven or eight chin ups okay. and probably ten you know and, and it's hard because, it, you know, I work with kids most of the time and they can all crank them out like they're nothing. Yeah. So, you know, so that's the first mistake is just getting strong enough. You know, I have nothing against kipping chin-ups and all those, you know, because it, it, it's a sport and they're just trying to do something that's get their chin above the bar as fast as they can in the most efficient way. But they need to go back and make sure they also do a lot of strict work. You can't just kip. Mm. So that's the first mistake. Um, the second mistake I think is, there's kind of three different ways to do a muscle up, you know, in, in, in that area, you know, you can do a strict, you can do a false grip kipping and you can do, you know, the big old swing one, you know, and I think they all just don't understand the concepts and how each is different. Okay. You know, the, can you explain a bit? Um, well, the, like a regular old false grip muscle up, strict muscle up, you basically pull down, you make sure that you, when you, do your chin up, your toes are in front of you just a little bit, you know, so you kind of pull to your chest. So you're, you, you mm. pull to a hollow. Then when you do the transition and you sit up, your butt's going to roll back, you know, rock back. And that's kind of the important part of it. So that when your back ro- rocks back, then you're going to turn over and you're going to get up on top and you do a dip. Um, then when we do, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Can okay. you just, um, can you like describe what a false grip is for people as well? False grip is when you shove your wrists all the way in the ring so that the ring is actually sitting on your wrist and not just in the palm of your hand. 
sense. Okay. And it's quite an uncomfortable thing for people to begin with. Right. Yeah. It's awful. But, you know, you... <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, you have to work on, you know, people work on, work on their false grip by just hanging in it. But it does make a muscle up a lot easier because you're, you're kind of cheating it a little bit. You know, mm. we false grip a lot of strength moves to kind of cheat them because then you're just making, you know, your lever arm is shorter. So it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so then you can do a, you know, people then took that strict muscle up, I think is what happened is, and then they decided, okay, well, I'm going to put a little swing to it. And so they call that the kipping, kipping, you know, false grip muscle up. And it, it's kind of the same motion, only you put a little swing, you swing up to that hollow position, you pull down to your chest, and you, instead of just letting your butt rack behind you, you kind of throw your feet so that your shoulders, you, you roll up the rings. And that's kind of the part that a lot of people miss is they never get on top of the rings on their muscle up. Their shoulders are always behind them and their knees are always up in front, if that makes sense. Yes. yes. And at the end of the muscle up, what you want to think of is you basically are going to roll up the rings. You're doing a, you know, your shoulders are coming up. So in order for your shoulders to come up, you want your feet to go down. So especially when you're doing the big swinging muscle up, the part that everybody misses, they do a big swing and then they try to sit up. And when they're sitting up, their, their knees are still going up and they can't get turned over to get on top. So they're, they're bad at the swinging up and then you got to open your hips and drive your feet underneath you. So that that causes you to roll up the rings and get up and support. Okay, nice. If you, if you can picture it. It's it's hard to, you know, explain, but Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um we'll we'll link some videos in the show notes to this. So if you go to alphamovement.co, I think I'm gonna put um slash Keith. So it's nice and easy. So alphamovement.co slash Keith, we'll put some some links to some show notes in there and uh, some videos for all of that kind of stuff. Um when you're at the bottom of a muscle up, obviously it's it's easier to start with those with those shoulders externally rotating the slight bend in the in the elbow just to like because people are like as you said, lacking range and lacking strength. How do you develop the ability to go from that internally rotated hands out position, um, which is a nice position to go from? Um, like how do you basically develop from the bent arm to the straight arm is what I'm asking. You, you know, I, 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 make, I would make them just do lots of swings. You know, I mean, people like my nephew, when I taught him how his muscle up and that's what he's known for, that's kind of, you know... Because I would just make them do sets and sets of swings, you know, and, and then your body kind of naturally in the back swing, you're going to turn the rings out so that then you can keep your, you know, you can open up your arm, you know, your shoulders yeah. and it feels better. And then, you know, through the bottom, you're, you'll just naturally turn them the right way. You, you know, I mean, I, I coach kids, so we don't use like externally rotated and things like that very much. It's more yeah. turn the rings this way. Does that make sense? And, and you kind of, we kind of just put them through the shape so that they just naturally do the right thing. And I think sometimes on that muscle up is just work your swings. Think of turning them out in the back swing, and then they're going to naturally, you know, as you get more flexible and as you just do more swings, they'll naturally turn the right way through the through the bottom, and your armpits will open, and your shoulder and your arms will get straight. Okay. Does, does that make sense? But I I would spend. You know, whenever you're working rings, I would do a couple sets, three sets of, you know, five to six swings. I mean, that's, that's what the kids I coach today do. That's what elite kids do. You know, I mean, you warm up with your swings. It's just kind of what you do. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, something I see a lot is people missing um, shoulder extension, being able to get the shoulders behind them. And I think that's why people miss a lot of, um, like, just can't do the transition in a muscle up. How would you develop that shoulder uh, flexibility? Um, well, doing swings will, will help. Doing those stretches in the morning, you know, doing the stretches, mm. the partner stretches help. Um, and I think it's, it's just like when people are doing them, they lose pressure on the rings. They're so worried about pulling to their chest or pulling to their hips or wherever yeah. they want to pull that um, you have to realize that you should have tension on the rings at all times. I mean, you know, if, if you can, if you can, have that pull back on your muscle up, you know, or so that you, you, you have pressure on the rings, that's going to allow you to rise. You know, when, when you lose tension, when you, then, then you're done, you know, then, then you have to do it all through sheer power. I mean, we want to use the swings. So that's why 
you always want to think of having pressure on the rings. You know, you 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 know you don't ever want to just have the rings have slack in them. You don't ever want to you know have slack in your body. You always want to have tension throughout the entire body in the ring. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Are there any cues that you find yourself using on muscle ups quite a lot? Um, like obviously, with like you, you probably see the same problems over and over again. Are there any like verbal cues or, or tactile cues that you use a lot for muscle ups? You know, I spot them a lot, and I think you know in gymnastics we spot a ton. I spot my kids all the time because I would rather they do something right with me than keep trying it and develop bad habits, and yeah. so. Um, one of my keys is I'll stand on a box next to them, and I have my hand, you know, as they're swinging, I my, you know, if I'm, I have my left hand on their shoulder and my right hand, they'll kick to my hand with their shin. And so what I tell them to think of is kick to my hand, and then drive your your heels down. So that you know that's gonna you know they kick to my hand, and then they drive their their shoulder their their hand their feet down. And then that'll turn them over. You know, that's that's the opening of the hips and the opening of the chest and the sit up. Nice. So that you know, and 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 it's a, it's a good thing because it I put it there so that they know where to kick to, so they're not kicking too high. And then they and it's also good for me because then when I'm spotting them, as they kick my hand, I grab their shin. So then when I'm spotting them, I have control of them. So yeah. you know, I you know, I I, I don't believe in just throwing someone up there on top of the rings, you know, because they might go over, they might get hurt. If you're spotting, you should have control, you know? And so I have a hand on the back and I have a hand on this chin so that then when I spot them, I'm kind of able to, you know, help them open up their hips and teach them how to drive their feet down. And if something goes bad, I've got them. Mm -hmm. I I suppose if you're, um, if you're spotting people or you're encouraging, like, uh, do you get the kids to spot each other? Um, not kid. I mean, they might spot each other like on, you know, if we're doing strength or something, they'll spot each other on handstand pushups, but not when there's motion, we wouldn't let a kid spot. Okay. That makes sense. I think a common misconception in, um, in gymnastics or uh, people outside gymnastics of gymnastics is that people have, um, gymnasts have very poor lower body strength. I think I've heard so many times that actually gymnasts can't jump very high because they use spring floors, but that's, um, it's bollocks basically. (laughs) What is the, um, what, how do you go about training leg strength in gymnastics? You know, I mean, there is a little, you know, um, truth to it a bit because you know if you think at least in guys gymnastics girls gymnastics is more legs because three Mm. events they're doing on their legs we have six events and only two are on our legs so it's if you have big heavy legs you know like a squat you know then then that's just a lot of weight to carry through on rings or pommel horse if that makes sense but but we do a lot of of leg strength you know we do a lot of um you know, we do some squats, not, you know, just more like lunge walks with, with weight. Um, we do a lot of, you know, jumping, you know, we might have a jump off a, a two foot or three foot block as high as you can jump to a squat and then jump onto another mat. So, right. so a lot of plyometrics, we try not to do too, too much of that because, you know, it, it, we don't want to pound the bodies. We already pound our bodies enough that we don't need to do it even more. Um, we just do a lot of mat jumps and, you know, we do a lot of lunge walks is, is pretty much it. I mean, when you think we're already running a lot, tumbling, we're already, you know, a lot of gymnastics, we are already doing strength. You know, our whole practice is strength, if that makes sense. I mean, we're jumping and doing everything else that we don't spend a whole whole bunch of time on our legs, you know, once or twice a week. Yeah. We'll do legs. Is there anyone who's really affected your coaching style or someone that you look up to as a, as a great coach? You know, I think it's, um, Kevin Majika is, is amazing. You know, when you have kids, um, Dennis McIntyre, who's head of USA gymnastics, um, when you have kids that do pretty good, you go to, um, the Olympic training center when they make national team. And so then you're around all these incredible other incredible coaches, you know, and, um, 
and, and it, you know, there's, there's a ton of them, you know, Dave Jessup is a, is a guy that's in, in Stanford. And it, it's so funny because I'll put a video down and the first thing he'll do is he'll critique it on Facebook. <laughs> and I knew you're going to do this. You know, I've got this little eight year old, his mom knows him like <laughs> eight years old. That is so <laughs> old, babe, you know, but, but it, it, it's, it's amazing how many brilliant people and technically great coaches there are out there. And, you know, and so I would say those three are, mm-hmm. are, are three of the best ones um, in the United States. You know, I, I'm probably not as, you know, I, I'm more of a raw, raw coach as, a, you know, as to the Nats ass that they are, you know. What makes a good coach? I think it's just caring about the kids and making sure that um, you, you care about everything about them. You know, not only them as kids, but realizing every decision you make or what you do to them today is going to affect every part of their life tomorrow. I mean, you can, it could just be gymnastics, something so simple as, you know, letting them get away with turning their hands the wrong way. And, you know, you're, you know, you have to be vigilant about those kind of things that are going to affect the future Two, you know, making sure that, you know, when they grow up and they're away from the sport, they, they look back and, and you've made an important contribution in their life and made them better. You know, I mean, that's kind of, the whole point of coaching, you know, is really just raising kids, making kids better through the sport of gymnastics. Was there, or who was your, like your most impactful coach that you had? Was there any, was anyone who particularly set the foundations for you to get where you've got today? Yeah, I had a coach, um, his name was John McDonald, who was my coach when, you know, back when I was a gymnast, because I'm 50, it wasn't as technical back then and people um, didn't, no gymnastics as well. You know, the technique wasn't as good. And, and he kind of lucked out that he had me and my teammate happened to just be, you know, fairly gutsy. And we just kind of got it. Our bodies just kind of did the right thing. And so, and he just understood gymnastics too. And he ended up going to Russia at one point, um, you know, and there was a gym called Dynamo and they were the ones that were like, you know, they were, they were like at the forefront of gymnastics and he spent a couple of weeks over there. And so he came back and then he kind of taught us that. And so, you know, he was the best coach I ever had. I went to college and, you know, my college coaches were good, but they weren't him, you know, cause he just got it. He understood gymnastics and how the body moves and, you know, how everything relates. So. Okay. Who's the first person that you think of when you hear the word successful? Um, you know, I think like in life, probably my brother, um, my brother has a great family, great job, close kids. Um, he had, he had um, you know, he had esophagus cancer, 10% chance to live or whatever. You know, it's an awful thing to have. And I mean, he went through some hard times, but he came through it. So probably him. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty good person to, what, what else makes him successful in your mind? I think just his relationship with his kids, his kids are older. Um, and it's kind of cool that, you know, how close he is and how they all come back to him. Um, you know, and he, he, he does well. I mean, he's just a really good person, you know. Nice. Um, and if you had a billboard and you could put it anywhere in the world, what would you put on it and what would it say? Ah, man. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't asked anyone else this question. No, yeah, um, no. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, I think it's just, you know, be happy with what you have. You know, I mean, everyone's kind of got their own lot in life. And, you know, you just kind of got to make best with what you have, you know. Nice. That's not um, a very good one, but. No, that's, that's, I think that's, uh, <laughs> I think that's more powerful than it, than it sounds straight away. I think if you actually uh, take that advice and action it, I think there's, there's a huge amount of value in it. So where can people find out a bit more about you? Um, I'm on Instagram, Coach Keith Pettit. Every day, I, or most days, I post something. And then I have a website, CoachKeithPettit.com. Um, so I, you know, have videos and um, tutorials, um, you know, I'm, some some drills that I work with my kids. I kind of, it's kind of gymnastic-y plus CrossFit. You know, when I work with some of the top CrossFitters, I have videos of them. And um, so um, check it out, Coach Keith Pettit. 
Yeah, genuinely, your your Instagram feed is inspiring, interesting, phenomenal. Um, it's it's a really good resource and it's very educational as well. So I, I definitely recommend checking that out. It's it's really really cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, I've been sat in the straddle position for about an hour, and my hands are <laughs> asleep. So I'm um, I'm going to call it a day there. But thank you so much, Keith, for jumping on the show. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Alpha Moon Podcast. To find show notes, unique downloads, and more information on the Academy, head to alphamovement.co slash blog. And if you enjoyed this episode, head over to iTunes and subscribe. And whilst you're there, please leave me a five-star review. And don't forget, you can follow me, Tom Boxley, on social media all over the place, or you can find more about the Alpha Movement at facebook.com slash alphamovementofficial.com.